Policing in areas controlled by drug cartels is an extremely challenging and often thankless task. Every day, law enforcement officers willingly put their lives at risk in the ongoing battle against drug cartels, which are notorious for their brutality and retaliatory actions. Now, let's explore the stories of some courageous heroes who have apprehended cartel members and delve into the outcomes they faced thereafter. Enrique Kiki Camarena, a prominent figure in the United States War on Drugs, served as a dedicated DEA special agent. Born on July 26, 1947, in Mexicali, a small town near the Mexican-American border, his family relocated to Calexico, California in 1956 in pursuit of a better life. Kiki spent the remainder of his childhood in Calexico and completed his high school education there. Upon joining the Marine Corps, Kiki quickly earned a reputation as a disciplined and dependable soldier who adhered strictly to regulations. He served in the Marines until 1970, when he was honorably discharged. Following his military service, Kiki decided to return to Calexico. Despite many years of military experience, Kiki's desire to serve persisted, leading him to work as a firefighter for the city of Calexico. During this time, he also pursued higher education at Imperial Valley College, a public community college in California, and earned an associate's degree. In 1970, Kiki transitioned to the Calexico Police Department, eventually being assigned to El Centro, which was just 11 miles away from Calexico. There, he worked as a special agent for the Imperial County Narcotic Task Force, ICNTF. By this point, the U.S. government had recognized the growing complexity of its drug problem, necessitating a specialized agency with full jurisdiction over drug-related cases. Consequently, the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, was established in 1973. Kiki, driven by his passion for narcotics work, saw joining the DEA as an opportunity to make a more significant impact in the ongoing war on drugs. Coincidentally, the DEA was actively recruiting Spanish-speaking agents at the time, leading both Kiki and his sister Myrna to join the agency in 1973. In 1974, Enrique began his career as a special agent at the DEA's Calexico resident office. By 1977, he had transferred to the agency's Fresno field office, where his extensive experience working undercover gave him a valuable edge that few of his fellow agents possessed. He excelled in his work, and one of his distinguishing traits was his remarkable ability to seamlessly blend into various situations. He had a knack for extracting information discreetly without raising suspicion. Elaine Shannon, the author, even described Kiki as having the uncanny ability to effortlessly adopt a Puerto Rican accent or employ Mexican street slang, depending on the demands of his role. Beyond his remarkable adaptability, Kiki was known for his unwavering commitment and dedication to the DEA's core values. He was incorruptible, driven by a deep sense of purpose to help keep drugs off the streets. Kiki's colleagues could sense his relentless drive, and anyone who had the privilege of working alongside him knew that he was genuinely committed to making a difference. He once confided in his mother, expressing his belief that even as a single individual, he could have a meaningful impact. In 1980, after three years at the Fresno office, Kiki transferred to the DEA resident office in Guadalajara. This move was prompted by the pressing need for more agents in the region, given the escalating challenges in Guadalajara at the time. However, this transfer was not a solo endeavor. Kiki was relocating with his family, including his wife and three sons. This transition placed him and his family in the heartland of one of Mexico's most brutal and violent cartels at the time, the infamous Guadalajara Cartel. This cartel had gained notoriety for its ruthless tactics, which included torturing and mercilessly killing both rivals and law enforcement officers. Their attacks often extended to the families of their targets. Given the nature of his work, Kiki was well aware of the constant risk that his family faced in this perilous environment. Nevertheless, despite his deep commitment to his work, there was nothing Kiki valued more than the safety and well-being of his family. Still, he knew that there was important work to be done. U.S. laws, in accordance with the Mansfield Amendment passed in 1975, 
rightly prohibit DEA agents from participating in arrests outside the United States. This restriction acknowledges the sovereignty of other nations, as foreign law enforcement agencies similarly do not conduct operations on American soil. Consequently, the DEA primarily focuses on gathering intelligence abroad, and the information collected is typically shared with local law enforcement agencies. The decision to take action based on this intelligence rests with the local authorities, emphasizing the importance of maintaining strong relationships between the DEA and foreign law enforcement agencies. Enrique Camarena's assignment in Guadalajara revolved around intelligence gathering. Acting on information from an informant, Enrique learned about the existence of a vast 200-acre plantation called Rancho Buffalo, where narcotics were cultivated. This plantation, allegedly generating up to $8 billion annually, was owned by Juan José Esparagoza Moreno, a member of the Guadalajara cartel. In August of 1982, Enrique successfully pinpointed the location of this plantation, verifying its presence through two aerial reconnaissance flights. Once he had solidified all the intelligence he had gathered, he shared it with Mexican authorities, who subsequently conducted a raid leading to the destruction of the plantation. This operation marked one of the most significant discoveries of its kind at that time. Tragically, on February 7, 1985, Kiki Camarena was abducted by members of the Guadalajara cartel. Over a grueling 30-hour period, he was subjected to torture and ultimately murdered. It became evident that his death was a direct consequence of his involvement in the crackdown on the Rancho Buffalo Plantation. However, Kiki's death triggered an extensive joint manhunt by both U.S. and Mexican authorities. This intensive pursuit resulted in the capture and conviction of three top leaders of the Guadalajara cartel. Furthermore, the U.S. investigation into Enrique's murder led to the apprehension and subsequent trials of ten other members of the cartel. Kiki Camarena was posthumously honored with the DEA's Administrator's Award for his unwavering dedication and sacrifices in the fight against drug cartels. The highest honor that the agency can bestow, the Award of Honor, bears the name of Kiki Camarena, a testament to his enduring legacy. In Calexico, a school, a library, and a street are also named in his honor, serving as lasting tributes to one of the DEA's greatest agents and a hero to countless individuals. When it comes to law enforcement, few individuals can match the remarkable career of Michael Vigil. A true exemplar of courage and precision, he boasts a record that attests to his exceptional abilities. In a profession where the smallest misstep can imperil not only your life, but also the lives of your loved ones, Mike Vigil stood out as an unwavering force. Formerly serving as the Chief of International Operations for the DEA, Mike Vigil's illustrious 31-year career rendered him one of the most highly decorated agents in the agency's history. He orchestrated numerous multinational operations spanning 36 countries. However, Mike Vigil's journey, like that of many, commenced on a smaller scale. Born in Espanola, New Mexico in 1951, Mike Vigil harbored a fervent desire to pursue a career in law enforcement from a very early age. As a child, he was captivated by crime television shows such as Dragnet, FBI, and The Untouchables, which ignited his passion for crime fighting. This childhood interest persisted and solidified his resolve to actively combat crime. In 1973, he took the first step towards this goal by enrolling in the DEA Academy in Washington, D.C. Upon completing his education at New Mexico State University at the tender age of 22, Mike embarked on one of the most daunting roles in law enforcement. His mission, to infiltrate the drug cartels of Latin America and assume the identity of a Mexican drug trafficker. It was a job that brimmed with peril, as the consequences of his cover being exposed could swiftly spiral out of control. In such a scenario, there were few lifelines from the U.S. government, leaving him largely self-reliant and compelled to make crucial split-second decisions. Safeguarding his family from harm was yet another weighty responsibility he bore. Remarkably, Mike not only shouldered these burdens, but excelled in his role. His efficiency and the wealth of intelligence he provided played pivotal roles in apprehending numerous cartel members. 
his work also provided invaluable insights into the inner workings of these criminal organizations, benefiting the DEA and other law enforcement agencies immensely. During his time in the field, Mike encountered a plethora of harrowing situations, some of which he has detailed in books he authored. One such gripping account hails from the 1970s in Sonora. While undercover and engaged in a meeting with two drug traffickers, Mike found himself under attack. These traffickers were in the employ of Rafael Caro Quintero, the leader of the Guadalajara cartel, the same individual under whose command Enrique Camarena had suffered torture and met a tragic end in 1985. As Mike waited to exchange counterfeit currency for three tons of marijuana, a Mexican federal agent accompanying him grew nervous and abruptly trained his firearm on one of the traffickers, thus exposing Mike's cover. What followed was a fierce shootout during which the Mexican federal agent lost his life. Mike himself faced the dire threat of gunfire but miraculously escaped unscathed. In a matter of seconds, he managed to shoot the assailant twice in the chest, averting further danger. Federal agents stationed around the building swiftly swarmed in, apprehending the second drug trafficker and confiscating the drugs in his possession. Yet even amidst these high-stakes moments, Mike's career held even more astonishing chapters. In the 1980s, Mike found himself sitting beside none other than Pablo Escobar, the kingpin of the Medellin cartel at soccer games. This surreal scenario unfolded while Mike covertly gathered intelligence on Escobar, a testament to the audacious nature of his work. One of the defining moments in Mike's illustrious career was the arrest of a Honduran trafficker named Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros. Remarkably, Juan Ramon was one of the individuals responsible for the kidnapping of Enrique Kiki Camarena, whose tragic fate we discussed earlier. During Juan Ramon's apprehension, he brazenly offered Mike a bribe of three and a half million dollars in exchange for his freedom. Mike, unwavering in his integrity, firmly rejected the offer and proceeded with the arrest, a testament to his resolute character. After decades of service in the field, Mike ascended to the position of head of the DEA's international offices. In this capacity, he was involved in high-profile missions targeting some of the most dangerous cartel members across Latin America. Following his retirement, he assumed the role of special agent in charge of the DEA's San Diego office. Subsequently, he transitioned to work for a private consulting firm in Washington, D.C., where he currently resides. Now 73 years old, Mike continues to receive intelligence from contacts in the regions where he once operated. His commitment to his work took a toll on his personal life, as he always harbored concerns about the demands of his career encroaching on his personal relationships. Consequently, despite marrying at the age of 41, he chose not to have children, viewing it as a necessary sacrifice to perform his duties efficiently. In his view, the demands of his work would have made it challenging to be fully present for a family. Mike Vigil is widely regarded as a hero by many, his illustrious career culminating in the apprehension of numerous dangerous individuals. He has received numerous national and international honors, including being named an honorary general by the government of Afghanistan and receiving the key to the city of Shanghai from China. Additionally, he was bestowed with an admiral's sword by the former president of the Dominican Republic, Hippolito Mejia. Another notable figure in the world of undercover work is Robert Mazur. Robert Mazur stands as a true hero in the realm of law enforcement, Renowned for his remarkable feats in infiltrating cartels operating in Mexico and Latin America, he dedicated 27 years of his life as a federal special agent, serving with distinction across various agencies, including the IRS, the Customs Service, and the Drug Enforcement Administration. However, it was during a five-year period that Robert Mazur solidified his legendary status. He embarked on a daring undercover mission, immersing himself in the intricate world of cartels while assuming the role of a money launderer under the alias Bob Musella. Recognizing that dismantling cartels required not only tracking the flow of drugs, but also the trail of money, Robert set out to unravel this critical financial aspect. 
Bob Musella's mission was to penetrate the inner workings of cartels, delving as deep as possible to understand the elaborate mechanisms behind their immense wealth and how it was moved and distributed. The cartels operated with impressive organization and sophistication, and Robert aimed to decode their methods. Creating the perfect cover was imperative. Bob Musella could not afford to raise suspicion under any circumstances. Failure was not an option, as it could lead to dire consequences, including the threat of death. Therefore, every facet of Bob's character had to be meticulously crafted to perfection. Crucially, Bob needed to earn the trust of the criminal masterminds. This was paramount to his mission's success. Any hint of inconsistency or deception would trigger their suspicion, potentially jeopardizing the entire operation. To achieve this, Robert and his team meticulously fabricated an entire life and career for Musella. He purported to work at a mortgage brokerage firm based in Florida, with the additional distinction of having a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. As a notorious money launderer, he naturally attracted the attention of various criminal elements. Robert's portrayal of Bob Musella was so convincing that even in the paranoid and distrustful world of organized crime, he managed to win their confidence. Robert managed to cultivate the trust of his numerous clients, granting him access to their underworld of ill-gotten wealth. He swiftly began unraveling the intricate ways in which they concealed their tainted riches. His focus on following the money proved incredibly fruitful. To bolster his character, Robert spared no expense when it came to entertaining his clients. He spared no expense, whining and dining them at the most opulent restaurants and whisking them away to exclusive clubs. He even took it a step further by footing the bill for extravagant trips, all in a bid to solidify his image as the one dirty banker they could trust implicitly. This calculated approach was vital to the success of his mission. Reflecting on the role he played as Bob Musella, Robert himself explained, My role was to come across to the cartel as a credible money launderer. To achieve that, I had to be deeply embedded in legitimate businesses. Over 18 months, he meticulously constructed the undercover operation. Employing informants and collaborating with concerned businessmen, he gained entry into genuine enterprises. When he eventually met with cartel members, they had full confidence in the legitimacy of the investment company he represented. During his undercover operation, Robert unraveled a web of intricate financial maneuvers used by criminals to obfuscate the origins of their wealth. The cartel, particularly the Medellin cartel, employed a tactic known as layering. Money would be funneled through various businesses and offshore accounts across multiple locations, rendering it nearly impossible to trace back to the drug traffickers. Robert's investigations took a startling turn when he discovered that the cartel had a partnership with the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, a Luxembourg-based financial institution with branches in over 70 countries. The BCCI was complicit in laundering the cartel's illicit funds, maintaining accounts for drug operatives, terrorists, corrupt bankers, and anyone seeking to conceal their money. This revelation was deeply troubling, as it had the potential to fuel further violence and criminality. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, Robert embarked on a two-year journey to amass evidence and track the criminal activities of both the cartel and BCCI. The money being shuffled around was tainted with blood, posing a grave threat. Action needed to be taken swiftly to halt these operations and disrupt the cycle of violence and evil they sustained. Once Robert felt confident that he had amassed enough evidence to put away a significant number of these criminal figures for an extended period, he devised a cunning plan. He orchestrated a phony engagement and extended invitations to many of his criminal associates for a bachelor party. Due to the rapport he had built with them, a considerable number of guests accepted the invitation. Unbeknownst to his invited guests, the event was a meticulously laid trap. As they boarded town cars, assuming they were en route to a bachelor party, they found themselves under arrest instead. The operation culminated in a massive bust that resulted in the seizure of over 3,100 pounds of cocaine. Moreover, it led to fines and forfeitures exceeding $600 million. The most remarkable outcome was the collapse of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCCI which at the time stood as the seventh largest privately held bank in the world. 
Such was the impact of this operation that a substantial half-million-dollar bounty was placed on Robert's head. After dedicating years to undercover work, Robert Mazur retired from his role as a federal agent. Today, he serves as the president of Chase & Associates, an agency specializing in banking and risk assessment for public companies and law firms. Additionally, he presides over KYC Solutions, Inc., a firm that provides speaking engagements, expert witness services, and consulting globally. Robert continues to contribute to the field by designing and presenting curriculum for federal, state, and local law enforcement officers across the United States and the Caribbean. He has also penned a book titled The Infiltrator, My Secret Life Inside the Dirty Banks Behind Pablo Escobar's Medellin Cartel, in which he divulges the intricate details of his life as an undercover agent. The fight against drugs extended beyond the DEA and U.S. Customs Office. The United Kingdom, notably through HM Customs, has been actively engaged in combating the drug trade. HM Customs has been at the forefront of this battle, and one of their dedicated agents is Guy Stanton. One of the most renowned undercover agents who successfully infiltrated various cartels and criminal gangs is known by the alias Guy Stanton. In reality, the true identity of Guy Stanton remains a closely guarded secret, veiled in mystery to shield him and those around him from potential threats. Guy's clandestine work hinged on establishing trust within these cartels, and therefore his assumed identity had to seamlessly fit into the role he played. To the criminals he interacted with, Guy portrayed the persona of a proficient shipper, exceptionally skilled at facilitating the movement of narcotics to their desired destinations. He leveraged a fleet of boats to transport drug-laden containers from ports and airports. However, to nearly everyone outside his covert world, Guy appeared as an unassuming desk agent at the customs office. Even his family remained unaware of the perilous nature of his work. To enhance the credibility of his character, Guy deliberately wove a web of evasions and dodged both the UK police and HM Customs, creating a semblance of challenges and unpredictability in his dealings with criminal clients. Smooth, trouble-free operations would have aroused suspicion among those he engaged with. In addition to crafting a believable cover, Guy also developed a persona that matched the role he played. He portrayed himself as a lavish spender, a man who donned Hugo Boss designer suits and sported a Rolex watch valued at £175,000. His extravagant spending habits were so noteworthy that even American Express issued him its ultra-exclusive credit card. Guy operated as part of a team of infiltrators, primarily responsible for providing intelligence and identifying significant targets in crucial locations. However, a significant portion of his mission required him to operate independently, often spending months at a time immersed in the perilous world of undercover work. Like most undercover officers, Guy found himself isolated from family, friends, and any semblance of a normal life as he delved deeper into the criminal world. The constant threat of having his cover blown loomed large, with potential dire consequences for both his work and his personal safety. Fortunately, Guy managed to maintain his cover for an entire decade, a testament to his exceptional skills in undercover operations. His ability to gain the trust of some of the world's most dangerous criminals was a remarkable achievement. Guy successfully infiltrated not only London gangs, but also cartels operating in Afghanistan, Mexico, and South America. The intelligence he gathered facilitated numerous arrests while allowing him to remain discreetly in the shadows. Guy's remarkable journey even led him to infiltrate the infamous Medellin cartel, including the inner circle of the notorious drug lord Pablo Escobar. He gained entry to the cartel through one of his informants, a man named Caravnos, whose invaluable information had contributed to the apprehension of many drug smugglers. During his undercover work, Guy had the opportunity to meet Pablo Escobar's cousin, Vittorio, a high-ranking member of the cartel. Vittorio, entrusting Guy, blindfolded him and revealed a warehouse overflowing with stacks of money. He sought Guy's assistance in integrating this vast wealth into the banking system. Their relationship deepened, and Vittorio even accepted a satellite phone from Stanton for easier communication. This bond between them yielded critical intelligence that ultimately led to the interception of a substantial cocaine shipment concealed within a cargo of fruit pulp on a ship in Brazil. 
It was imperative that any tip-offs remained untraceable to Guy, safeguarding his undercover status at all costs. One of Guy Stanton's greatest concerns during his undercover work was the looming threat of a reprisal attack by the Medellin cartel. Thankfully, this fear did not materialize. However, Guy's most astonishing mission unfolded while he collaborated with an individual named William. William, a 35-year-old criminal, sought Guy's assistance in transporting a substantial cocaine shipment from Bellum to Holland. Guy strategically booked a luxurious hotel suite and ordered expensive champagne for their initial meeting, aiming to convey an image of extravagance to his clients, a tactic that had worked effectively in the past. This approach seemed to resonate with William. Their subsequent meeting took place in a public car park, this time involving William's team to finalize the details of the significant drug deal. However, the situation took a dangerous turn when a third-party group of two individuals arrived and opened fire on them. Fortunately, they were rescued by the police, leading to the arrest of William and his associates. Guy emerged unscathed, and the intelligence he provided proved instrumental in seizing the drugs. During the trial, Guy testified against William and his accomplices while concealing his identity with a disguise that rendered him unrecognizable to the criminals. Like all covert operations, Guy Stanton's decade-long undercover career eventually came to an end. He acknowledged the risks of continued exposure in the criminal world and opted to conclude his remarkable journey. While proud of his achievements as a deep undercover operative, he recognized that his undercover identity had become too well-known and decided to retire from that life. Today, he lives anonymously in the UK, having penned a book titled The Betrayer. The criminal alien squad, also known as the Crim Squad, was tasked with one of the most daunting roles within law enforcement, targeting and dismantling cartel hitmen and assassins. It goes without saying that this job was far from attractive, as cartels spare no effort to safeguard their interests and are willing to go to extreme lengths to do so. Pursuing cartel henchmen was a surefire way to attract a bounty on one's head, but the courageous members of the criminal alien squad faced this perilous challenge daily. The nature of their work was so precarious that, to this day, they cannot use their official names while in the field or speaking to the media to safeguard their identities. The cartels would stop at nothing to eliminate them if their true identities were exposed. The most formidable threat faced by the criminal alien squad was the Aralano Felix organization, commonly referred to as the AFO. From the 1990s until the mid-2000s, the AFO held sway in Tijuana, Mexico. Their penchant for violence was notorious, as they targeted and killed not only police officers and rival groups, but also innocent civilians who happened to cross their path. However, for the AFO, mere killing was insufficient. They engaged in gruesome practices, such as cooking the flesh of their rivals on flaming tires and delivering the remains by the hundreds to a figure known as El Piet. El Piet would then dissolve the corpses into a macabre stew, disposing of the liquid remains down a drain, leaving minimal evidence behind. The AFO reveled in their brutal operations for many years. In the face of such brutality, the members of the Criminal Alien Squad, a team of six dedicated officers, achieved something remarkable. They tirelessly pursued and apprehended over 300 felons in just five years, making the border towns between the U.S. and Mexico considerably safer for the public. This task was anything but easy, and the officers worked relentlessly, often sacrificing their evenings and weekends to track down and identify their targets. Their unwavering commitment to their mission was a testament to their bravery and dedication to public safety. The members of the Criminal Alien Squad firmly believed that anyone could be located if you knew where to search. They were highly adept in leveraging technology, including the internet and various resources, to aid in their investigations. They conducted stakeouts, sometimes tracking suspects for extended hours, even when officially off-duty. This team operated as an efficient and relentless machine, ceaselessly pursuing cartel henchmen. Another standout quality of the Crim Squad was their willingness to collaborate and work with various law enforcement agencies without the jurisdictional disputes often seen between organizations like the DEA and FBI. They were open to partnering with local police, 
state police, or any other drug law enforcement agency that could assist them. This cooperative approach proved more effective than internal disagreements, allowing them to achieve significant successes. The Crim Squad played a pivotal role in apprehending Furcio, whose real name was Andres Ramos Castillo. Furcio led a group of ruthless hitmen who were relentlessly pursuing Los Peleos, another violent faction operating out of Tijuana. Los Peleos were sicarios who had defected from the AFO and left a trail of bloodshed in their wake. Furthermore, the Crim Squad was instrumental in capturing El Teo, a prominent enforcer of the AFO. El Teo had perpetrated a reign of terror, claiming the lives of between 60 to 70 police officers in just two years. His brutal tactics made the streets exceedingly unsafe, as he was infamous for his insatiable bloodlust. On a daily basis, he committed heinous acts, such as hanging corpses from bridges, beheading police officers, and arranging their bodies to spell out his nickname, 3L. He would also mutilate individuals by severing their fingers and would kidnap innocent people, demanding ransoms from their families only to kill them even when the ransom was paid. El Teo's actions were unpredictable and caused immeasurable pain and suffering to countless families. Nonetheless, the Crim Squad succeeded in bringing this ruthless criminal to justice. El Teo proved to be a formidable challenge, but the Crim Squad was undeterred in their pursuit and apprehension of this notorious criminal. Their reputation was such that they received calls for assistance from various other law enforcement agencies. In 2009, for instance, Dave Contreras, a leader in the gang suppression team of the San Diego Police Department, sought the Crim Squad's expertise for Operation Stampede, a massive task force operation targeting the Southeast Locos, a local gang. The Crim Squad's role involved months of relentless tracking and monitoring, culminating in the apprehension of individuals just hours before they could commit murder. Despite their years of dedicated service, the Crim Squad rarely sought or received extensive recognition, as they were more focused on delivering exceptional results than receiving national honors and accolades. However, they did receive a significant form of recognition from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP. The CBP established a week-long school dedicated to Crim Squad tactics, known as the SIG Academy. This program became mandatory coursework for new Border Patrol investigators in San Diego, covering a wide range of topics from intelligence gathering to mobile surveillance, an area previously unexplored by the CBP until the Crim Squad's involvement. Their influence forever altered the CBP's operational methods. In 2010, the Crim Squad merged into a larger unit, the Border Crime Suppression Team. While some original team members moved on to other agencies such as the FBI and DEA, the exceptional work and legacy of these men continue to shape the operations of the CBP. They remain unsung heroes whose efforts have undoubtedly kept numerous criminals off the streets. Today, Former members of the squad occasionally reunite to share memories of their time in the field, reflecting on the thrilling and impactful moments they experienced. If you found this video enjoyable, please remember to like, subscribe, and share. For more captivating videos like this one, click on the recommendations appearing on your screen now.